Hey up everyone, Sarah, last night at the 96 Academy Awards, this happened. And the Oscar goes to Emma Stone. Oh. Emma Stone won her second ever Best Actress Oscar for playing Bella Baxter in Yorgos Lanthimos's Poor Things, and as you can see, I was very happy about it. All of award season, Best Actress was the closest and most exciting race to watch unfold. It was gonna come down to either Emma Stone for Poor Things or Lily Gladstone for Killers of the Flower Moon. Some people had dubbed this Best Actress race this year as the Battle of the Stones. Each of them had pros and cons working for and against them, but in the end, it was Emma Stone who took home the Oscar. And in this video, I'm gonna explain how and why Emma Stone ended up winning the Oscar. Before we jump in, I just wanna remind you guys, I make a lot of award season content all year round, and I also cover international film festivals on my channel, so if you want the early scoop on potential Oscar contenders for next year, be sure to click subscribe. Uh, my goal this year is to try and get to 10,000 subscribers before the end of the year, so please do help my channel where you can by subscribing, hitting the like button, or leaving a comment down below, it really does help. Anyway, that's the housekeeping, let's get back to the video. Now, I actually did predict that Emma Stone was going to win the Oscar. I did a whole deep dive discussion and prediction video on that subject, so I am going to regurgitate some of the facts from that vid, so apologies if you have heard me say some of this stuff before. In the end, my instinct turned out to be correct, and I'm so happy I listened to my gut feeling and my heart, because Emma Stone wasn't actually considered the favourite to win the Oscar. I mean, she was an early front runner when the award season started because she won the Golden Globe, the Critics' Choice, and the BAFTA. But the momentum shifted to Lily Gladstone after she won the SAG Award. Her SAG win was the defining factor as to why she became the bookie's favorite to win the Oscar. Because the SAGs were the last big precursor before the Oscars this year, and the Screen Actors Guild is obviously made up of actors. So when Lily Gladstone won the SAG, the momentum shifted back in her favor, and it looked like she was going to win, because if you win the SAG, it implies that you have the support of the largest voting branch of the Academy, which is actors. The SAGs have been a very reliable indicator as to who our acting winners are gonna be at the Oscars. In recent years, they've often matched four for four with the Oscars, with 2023, 2022, 2020, and 2018, all matching four for four. And also, what made SAG even more significant this year is that it was the final big awards precursor before the Oscars. Recent Oscars history suggests that whoever wins at the prior precursor, be that BAFTA or SAG, whichever actors win there, they, more often than not, are gonna be the winners at the Oscars as well. Why? Because the momentum of the fresh win from the prior precursor carries over into Oscars voting. So when the Academy come to place their votes, the winners of the past precursors are fresh in their minds. They might have given a great speech that has lingered in there. And yeah, often that, that does help them win the Oscar because they got this late surge of a victory at the prior precursor. It really, really does help significantly. Last year was the first time that SAG was the final precursor before the Oscars, and all four of the SAG winners went on to win the Oscar. So when Gladstone won at SAG, so many people saw that as definitive proof that she was gonna win the Oscar. So they jumped from the Emma Stone carriage over to the Lily Gladstone carriage. And honestly, I almost did the same. I nearly switched to Lily Gladstone, but there were a few factors that gave me pause for thought. And these factors are what I believe to be the reasons why Lily Gladstone didn't win the Oscar. Firstly, the comparison of Lily Gladstone to the previous Best Actress Oscar winner, Michelle Yeoh was being brought up a lot. And it's understandable, they had a lot in common. For one, Lily Gladstone and Michelle Yeoh had the exact same track record at all the precursors this award season. They both won and lost the exact same awards. The only major difference is that Michelle Yeoh won her Golden Globe in the comedy musical category, and Lily Gladstone won in the drama category, but they both lost the Critics' Choice and the BAFTA to their closest competitor, for Michelle Yeoh, it was Kate Blanchett. For Lily Gladstone, it was Emma Stone. And I might add that both of those uh, competitors had previously won Best Actress Oscars. And then both Michelle Yeoh and Lily Gladstone managed to pull it back and win the SAG Award. But also, you add in the X factor that both Michelle Yeoh and Lily Gladstone had history-making narratives. Michelle Yeoh was about to become the first ever Southeast Asian winner in Best Actress, and Lily Gladstone was about to become the first ever Indigenous American 
American woman to win Best Actress. Okay, their pathways were quite similar, so it makes sense why a lot of people were predicting the same outcome as the previous Oscars, because Lily Gladstone's train was on the same tracks as Michelle Yeoh's, she was just one stop behind. I think what happened here is that people got so excited about the prospect of another history-making win, as well as the fact that Lily Gladstone's journey this awards season was so similar to Michelle Yeoh's that they ended up getting tunnel vision. Because while their pathways seemingly do look similar, they weren't identical, and many people didn't spot what made Lily Gladstone's journey different to Michelle Yeoh's, or if they did, they just chose to ignore it. Michelle Yeoh was in a stronger position than Lily Gladstone going into Oscars night, and here's why. Firstly, Michelle Yeoh was in the Best Picture frontrunner that year, okay? Everything Ever All At Once was dominating the 2023 awards race. It was collecting lots of top prizes, Whereas with Killers of the Flower Moon, Lily Gladstone was actually kind of Killers' only hope of winning an Oscar. So Michelle Yeoh had the advantage of being in the more seen, more discussed, more passionate film. Killers didn't have anywhere near the same amount of passion as Everything Everywhere had. Everything Everywhere was going into Oscars night expecting to win big. But for Killers of the Flower Moon going into Oscars night, its best chance of a win was for Lily Gladstone. So yeah, when it comes to the films that she and Michelle Yeoh were in, Michelle Yeoh had a considerable advantage. Secondly, Michelle Yeoh may not have swept all of award season, but she did place at all the precursors where she didn't win Critics' Choice and BAFTA. Whereas Lily Gladstone, did miss entirely at BAFTA. Many award season pundits dismissed Gladstone's BAFTA snub as a fluke, a one-off, but I really took note of it. You see, at BAFTA, they decide the acting categories in a very unique way. There's a shortlist, which Lily Gladstone was on, and there are six slots in the category at BAFTA, and what they do is the top three people who get the most votes automatically make the ballot, and then a jury decides who gets the other three slots. So immediately we know that Gladstone didn't get into this category as one of the top three people who got the most votes, which is odd considering she was seen as a front runner at the time, but the jury also didn't feel the need to give Gladstone one of the other three slots, which was quite confusing. That BAFTA snub was a legit red flag for me because if she really was a top three favorite for best actress, then she would have automatically qualified because of the popular vote. At BAFTA, she clearly wasn't top three to the voters. But even the jury chose not to save her, which calls into question why? Why not put Gladstone in the six for BAFTA? There has to be a reason or reasons why BAFTA didn't pick her. The BAFTAs were quite weird with their appreciation for Killers of the Flower Moon because it did get nine nominations, but it missed in some significant categories like Best Director for Martin Scorsese, Best Actor for Leonardo DiCaprio, and obviously Lily Gladstone for Best Actress. And Gladstone's admission feels the most strangest, to be honest, because at that point, she was considered a frontrunner. At BAFTA, she wasn't even considered top three by the voters, which was cause for alarm, I'd say. You do have to wonder why didn't she place and why didn't the jury choose to save her? Was the fact that she didn't make top three at BAFTA evidence that she wasn't a frontrunner to begin with? We don't actually know who the top three for BAFTA actually were, who automatically qualified, but, if we presume that Emma Stone, Sandra Hula, and Kerry Mulligan, or even Margot Robbie, you know, performances that were in widely seen, widely discussed movies that got a lot of uh, BAFTA and Oscar nominations, performances in less buzzy films like Fantasia Bruno in The Color Purple or Vivian Oprah in Rye Lane, still managed to make the cut over Lily Gladstone, who is in the huge Martin Scorsese film of the year, Killers of the Flower Moon. That seems a little suspect to me, and I think the reason that it all boils down to is category confusion. I don't think all BAFTA voters quite agreed on whether Gladstone was a lead or a supporting character in her own film. I was one of the first people to watch this film in Cannes, and even I initially presumed that she would go supporting for this role. Then she announced to the world that she would be campaigning for lead actress, which she had every right to, but it did cause a little bit of discussion and a bit of confusion. I did a whole video on that subject, and I said in that video that I did think that Lily Gladstone would have a harder time winning in lead because 
It wasn't obviously apparent to everyone, myself included, that upon first watch of the film, that everyone viewed Lily Gladstone as a lead character, as evidenced by the amount of screen time that she had in that film. When there is any debate over category placement, be it lead or supporting, it can work against you. I think not everybody viewed Lily Gladstone's performance as a true lead, and I think it hurt her a little bit. Neither Michelle Yeoh or Emma Stone had that issue, okay? They were both the clear, primary central characters in their movies. Whilst Lily Gladstone was most definitely the primary female character and the heart and soul of her film, her character doesn't actually influence the plot all that much, okay? The plot isn't happening because of her, it's happening to her. The third reason why Lily Gladstone was different to Michelle Yeoh is that while they did share a similar history-making narrative of being the first potential winners for their respective minorities, Michelle Yeoh had the added bonus of being a seasoned industry veteran. She had a long, amazing career, and she'd previously been overlooked for Oscars recognition for performances in films like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and Memoirs of a Geisha. She'd been overlooked for her whole career, whereas with Gladstone, whilst I wouldn't say that she's a brand new newbie to the industry, her role in Killers was pretty much her true breakout role. Not a lot of people knew who she was until she got that part, okay? The role of Molly Burkhart really put her on the map. So it's not like Gladstone has had the same career as Michelle Yeoh. Arguably, her career is taking off now, whereas Michelle Yeoh was entering her golden years. So Michelle Yeoh had a stronger narrative, okay? She was overlooked, overdue and also had the history-making narrative that Lily Gladstone had. Okay, her narrative was stronger than Gladstone's. The fourth reason why Michelle Yeoh is different to Lily Gladstone is that when Michelle Yeoh won her SAG award, she had the added advantage of having all five days of Oscar voting to capitalize on the momentum that she gained with the SAG win. Uh, whereas with Lily Gladstone, when she won her SAG award, Oscar voting had already started, okay? She lost two days to the early birds who placed their votes. She only had three days, whereas uh, Michelle Yeoh had all five. And also, SAG also gave SAG Ensemble to Everything Ever All At Once, okay? The film was stronger. They could have given uh, SAG Ensemble to Kills the Flower Moon, but they didn't. They went with Oppenheimer. So it just evidences that the love for um, the movies was different. People really, really loved Everything Everywhere. They weren't as crazy about uh, Kills the Flower Moon, but what SAG do like to do often is they like to show support for minorities, okay? They like to champion the little guys or the people that, you know, need to be lifted up. Like, you can see it in the wins for SAG Ensemble for Parasite, uh, for Korean actors, uh, everything everywhere with mostly Asian actors, uh, with Coda, it was the same for like deaf actors, championing them. And so I think what they did was instead of giving Killers the win for SAG Ensemble, they chose to champion Lily Gladstone because she is a Native American woman. No Native American woman has ever won Best Actress there. So they decided to acknowledge Gladstone by giving her the win there. So yeah, actors definitely champion Lily Gladstone, but the entire industry overall wasn't as on board as they were. So to surmise what these similarities and differences were between Michelle Yeoh and Lily Gladstone, um, they both won the exact same awards at the big precursors, and the running order of the precursors was exactly the same both years. Michelle Yeoh placed at all the precursors, was unquestionably the lead character in her film, and her film was also the best picture frontrunner, and she also had a narrative that consisted of her being overlooked, overdue, and could potentially make history. And she also had the entire five days of Oscar voting to capitalize on the momentum of her win at SAG. Lily Gladstone, on the other hand, placed at most precursors, but missed the BAFTA. There was some confusion as to whether she was a lead or a supporting player. Her film, Killers of the Flower Moon, was in a weaker position because it wasn't the best picture frontrunner. In fact, Gladstone was kind of the film's only hope for an Oscar win. And while she did have a history-making narrative, she was still relatively new to the Academy circles and wasn't seen as someone overdue or overlooked by the Academy, individually I mean. When you think about what Lily Gladstone represents in terms of Native American actors, of course they are a community that has been 
widely overlooked and overdue for recognition by awards bodies. Uh, but that's actually a topic for another video, I think. And also, Lily Gladstone only had three days to capitalize on the momentum that she got from her SAG win, whereas Michelle Yeoh had all five. So yeah, it's easy to see the similarities between Michelle Yeoh and Lily Gladstone. I just think people were putting too much stock in that, and because of recency bias, people were expecting the exact same outcome, when in fact, there were several significant differences between their situations and circumstances. I think people were so excited with the idea of Lily Gladstone potentially making history and her having that last critical precursor win at the SAGs gave her the momentum. As well as the fact that the Academy decided not to give Kate Blanchett her third Oscar, instead giving Michelle Yeoh her first and making history as good enough a reason for them to not feel the desire to give Emma Stone her second Oscar when they can give Lily Gladstone her first and also make history. But the Michelle Yeoh comparison aside, were there any other factors that were working against Lily Gladstone? Actually, yes. When you scroll through the Best Actress winners at the Oscars, a common occurrence that you'll see with the winners is that, with maybe the exception of Frances McDormand for Nomadland, the winners tend to be for performances that are bigger, showier, or baitier. Performances where you see a lot of emotion visibly on display, or there's a big transformation to get into character. With Gladstone, while I would say that the type of role that she's playing does fit the bill of a typical Best Actress winner, you know, she's playing a real life person who endures a lot of tragic hardship, that's something the Academy usually goes for, the type of performance that she's giving doesn't quite fit the mold of a typical Best Actress winner because Gladstone's amazing performance is one of subtlety. It's a very understated performance where she does a lot without doing much at all. That's the power of a performance like this, that she can convey so much without her character verbally saying anything. She conveys it through her demeanor, her eyes, and what she's not saying. It's a performance of incredible subtext, and it's a remarkable skill to be able to do that, which is why Gladstone would have been absolutely deserving of this award. The problem for Gladstone was that Academy history suggests that they prefer to go for acting that they can see. They prefer the bigger performances. They like to see the distance traveled for the actor to get to that character because distance implies effort. And I know what some of you are probably thinking, Killian Murphy managed to win for a subtle internalized performance just this year. Why didn't Gladstone? Well, I'm glad you asked my friend because it ties in nicely as to why Frances McDormand won her Oscar for Nomadland. You see, you can still win for a quiet, less showy performance, but it helps considerably if your performance is also in the Best Picture frontrunner. Both Killian Murphy and Frances McDormand won Oscars for subtle lead performances in films which also managed to win Best Picture. So yeah, when you compare Gladstone and Stone's performances, they're both incredible, they both have merit, they both would have been deserving of the win, but for different reasons. Because they're very different types of performances, but Arguably Stones was always the type of performance the Academy would be more drawn to. But who knows how the race would have gone if Oppenheimer wasn't released this year and it didn't dominate this award season. Perhaps Killers of the Flower Moon might have had more support and maybe Gladstone might have had an even stronger chance to win. But it's important to note that Lily Gladstone wasn't the only one with factors working against her. Emma Stone also had her own set of obstacles for her to overcome. For one, her performance was in an off-kilter fantasy film and performances in genre films very rarely even get nominated at the Academy, let alone win. The counter argument to that though is that Michelle Yeoh did manage to win for a wacky sci-fi kung fu family comedy movie just last year, so that kind of disproves that. Counter counter argument is that because Michelle Yeoh won for a performance like that just last year, maybe the Academy were more inclined to give it to a different type of performance this year. But they didn't, and now we've had two back-to-back -back wins for Best Actress for genre films. The second obstacle for Stone to overcome was the fact that she was a previous winner. She won the Best Actress Oscar seven years prior for La La Land. Perhaps some Academy voters were thinking she doesn't need a second Oscar only seven years after she won previously. Again, counter-argument we've seen before with the Academy that they don't actually mind giving someone 
a second or even third acting Oscar in a short turnaround. Frances McDormand won her third for Nomadland only three years after she won her second for Three Billboards. Christoph Waltz also did it in three years and Mahersha Ali managed to do it in two. The third obstacle for Emma Stone to overcome is that some people were saying that because Poor Things was quite a raunchy movie, had a lot of full frontal nudity and a lot of sex scenes that some Academy voters might be put off by that. And counter argument to that is, Grow up. <laughs> the Academy are not that prudish. Give me one example of someone losing an acting Oscar because the role might have been too saucy or too sexual. If anything, I would say that it would help because it just illustrates the bravery of an actor to put themselves out there like that and bear it all. Bear in mind, this was Emma Stone's first time doing full frontal nudity. I know she had her boobs out in The Favourites, but like, she bared it all in Poor Things. And also, this was the first movie role that she took after she gave birth to her first child, okay? Again, it just shows immense bravery to do that when you're a new mother. And the fourth obstacle for Emma Stone, and I'd argue this was the most significant obstacle for her to overcome, was the fact that she lost the SAG award to Lily Gladstone. So she didn't have the momentum, and it also implied that she didn't have the support of the largest voting branch of the Academy actors. The counter argument to that is though, it's not like Emma Stone didn't have the SAG nomination, she just didn't win. Lily Gladstone didn't have the BAFTA nomination, period. Plus, the Academy is quite international now, okay? There is a large contingent of voters who live outside of the US, and perhaps the international voters of the Academy didn't feel as emotionally close to Lily Gladstone's plight as, say, the American voters did. In other words, it's America's history, not the rest of the world's, okay? There's no cultural obligation or bias to give it to a Native American if they're not from that country. They just went with what they like the best, which probably was Stone, but I'm sure Sandra Hula also had some support. So you see, every argument that was working against Emma Stone is easily refutable. When it comes to Lily Gladstone though, not so much. Her BAFTA snub was a bigger issue than people initially realized. While it's absolutely possible to win the Oscar without a BAFTA nomination, look at Sandra Bullock, Regina King, Jared Leto, Matthew McConaughey, they all managed to win the Oscar without a BAFTA nomination, but that was before the restructuring of the BAFTA nomination process. In this new era of BAFTA nominations being half decided by a jury, not placing a BAFTA can be a sign of a bigger issue at play. I think Gladstone's miss at BAFTA was indicative of category confusion and the fact that Lily Gladstone's history-making narrative wasn't really translating to voters who came from outside of the USA. But people chose to ignore those factors because they really liked Lily Gladstone's performance and they were excited of the prospect of her making history. But they chose to ignore the warning signs or just dismiss it as a one-off BAFTA fluke in order to make the win for Gladstone at the Oscars seem plausible. So yeah, the lack of a BAFTA nomination can be overcome, but in my head, when I tried to rationalize it, the path to Oscar's success makes more sense for Emma Stone to win without winning the SAG award, but still will be nominated, than it does for Lily Gladstone to win the SAG, but not have the BAFTA nomination at all. So in hindsight, it's actually quite easy to see why Stone was the more logical pick at the Oscars over Gladstone or even Hula, because Emma Stone was the only one of those three who didn't have a historical stat to overcome, because Lily Gladstone needed to win without a BAFTA nomination, and Sandra Hula needed to win without a SAG nomination. Emma Stone didn't have that obstacle and she pretty much ticked every box. What she did have was the fact that her performance was in a heavily nominated film. It got 11 nominations. In fact, it was the most nominated film after Oppenheimer, uh, which was the Best Picture Frontrunner. And also, yeah, Poor Things was nominated for Best Picture. Granted, it wasn't the Best Picture Frontrunner, but to be fair, neither was Lily Gladstone's film. But we know now that Poor Things was viewed by the Academy as the stronger movie because it won three other Oscars for production design, costume design, and hair and makeup. And it always had a chance to win in those categories. It's not like they were freak accident wins. They weren't surprises. Killers didn't seem likely to win in any categories other than Best Actress. So Poor Things was viewed as the more well-rounded film, okay? It had more support than Killers did. Emma Stone also placed in all of the precursors. Only her and Carrie Mulligan managed to accomplish that, 
but she was also the nominee with the most precursor wins because she had the Golden Globe, the Critics' Choice Award and BAFTA, which is just evidence that she always had support. Emma Stone's performance as Bella Baxter also fits the mold of the type of performance that usually wins Best Actress at the Oscars more so. It's a showcase of her abilities as an actress, demonstrating her comedic timing, the English accent, her emotional versatility, and her physicality. As Bella is undergoing a rapid coming of age development throughout the film, we see her grow up before our eyes as she's exposed to the beauty and the horrors of life. So there was a variety of emotional avenues for Stone to explore as Bella experiences new experiences for the first time. From eating yummy pastries to the joy of furious jumping to the annoyance of crying babies to the heartbreak of witnessing poverty and suffering firsthand. There was an emotional spectrum for her to work with here in Poor Things. You really do see a character evolution with Bella from infant to wide-eyed, adventurous, and naive adolescent, to the dark patch of adulthood, to enlightened adult with her own agency and independence. It's 30 years worth of character development compacted into a two and a half hour film. It is a staggering accomplishment of a performance from Emma Stone. Yes, it's showier than Gladstone's, but it's just as impressive and deserving of acknowledgement as Gladstone's is, just for different merits. So yeah, both Gladstone and Emma Stone had pathways to win the Oscar. I think recency bias influenced a lot of people's decisions here when they were predicting Best Actress because Michelle Yeoh's pathway looks so similar to Lily Gladstone's, so it makes sense to predict Gladstone because it was familiar and safe, logical. But with Emma Stone's pathway, it may have been the road less traveled, but it was the brighter and clearer path, in my opinion. Anyway, let's summarize the video. I know some people are disappointed because it would have been awesome to see the first ever Indigenous American person win in this category, okay? It was a cool narrative. But we have seen in the past with the Academy that people have won with a narrative, like Michelle Yeoh, but there were other factors, like the fact she was in a Best Picture frontrunner. And we also seen people lose with a narrative, like Glenn Close for The Wife, or Chadwick Boseman and Viola Davis for Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. It's just important to remember that there are more factors and variables at play at the Oscars than just a narrative. I think a lot of it actually comes down to how well liked the movie you're in is. If your film has broad support and is like winning in other categories, that certainly helps. And if it's nominated for Best Picture, that also helps. And I honestly think a lot of voters just vote for what they like and don't let outside political factors influence their decision. And I've said this before on the channel, but just because the Academy can make history doesn't mean they're going to make history. And it's important to remember to take the victories where you can, because remember, Gladstone has already made history by being the first ever Indigenous American woman to be nominated for Best Actress at the Oscars, okay? She's blazed the trail for others to follow in her footsteps. That in itself is a huge accomplishment, and one she can be proud of, it's already part of her legacy. Hopefully this isn't the last we see of Lily Gladstone at the Oscars. Her performance as Molly Burkhart has opened a lot of doors for her. She's practically a household name now, and people are very aware of her talent. I just hope because of the success of Killers, it leads to more opportunities, more substantial roles, and other chances to be nominated at the Oscars in the future. She may not have won the Oscar this time, but she doesn't walk away from this award season as a loser. She did win some substantial prizes, but the way she carried herself this award season with such grace and dignity is commendable. The industry and the world wants to see more from her. The way I see it, she's just getting started. So I say congratulations to Lily Gladstone. You accomplished so much this year, and I cannot wait to see what you do next. For Emma Stone, for me, it was always an instinctual gut feeling with this performance. Like when I saw this film back at the Venice Film Festival, I instinctively knew right away that this is a Best Actress winning performance. It's the same feeling I got for Brendan Fraser's performance in The Whale two years ago when I saw that at Venice, okay? Sometimes you just know when you're looking at a performance that the Academy is going to champion. It's a knee-jerk feeling that I get, and with Lily Gladstone, I didn't get that knee-jerk feeling right away. I did, however, think, oh, this is a performance that's gonna get an Oscar nomination, but at the time, I thought she was gonna get nominated in Best Supporting Actress. Ooh, there's a question. If Lily Gladstone had decided to campaign supporting, do you think she would have beaten Divine Joy Randolph at the Oscars? I'm honestly not sure. Whatever you guys have to say, let me know in the comment section down below. But yeah, Emma Stone, in my opinion, had the clearer pathway to victory and arguably had the better winner's package. Her performance was the showier of the two. It's more the Academy's cup of tea. Her film had more support in other categories. She was the obvious lead character in her film. Gladstone was debatable. She didn't miss any precursors and won most of them. She may not have had a narrative like Gladstone, but many did see her performance as 
Bella Baxter as Emma Stone's greatest performance to date. It was challenging, fearless, and in the wrong hands, Bella Baxter could have easily come across as a caricature, but Stone delivered a multi-layered, versatile performance as Bella Baxter, and it's an iconic character that is gonna be discussed in film discourse for years to come. All of that was a winner's package, and I'm so glad I went with my gut and predicted Emma Stone. It just made so much sense to me. The fact of the matter is, any one of the top three contenders in this category, Lily Gladstone, Sandra Hula, or Emma Stone, would have been a great winner. It was a very competitive year, and sadly, only one can be the victor. And this year, it was Emma Stone, so congrats to her. Hopefully this video has been helpful in explaining how and why Emma Stone won the Oscar. Please do let me know your thoughts on Best Actress in the comment section down below. Was there anything that I missed? Remember, I do award season content and movie reviews all year round, so don't forget to click subscribe, help me get to 10,000 subscribers for the end of the year. And as always, thank you guys so much for watching. For more things related to movies, TV, the Oscars, and popcorn culture, I'm Luke Airfield, and I'll see you next time.